Hi, everyone, and welcome to the official Succession podcast from HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. There's blood in the water. Sharks are coming. You know, my husband is a player in this, and in one world, there's, uh, I'm in a position to come out here as CEO. You destroy Kendall, it falls apart. I'm Kara Swisher, and I report on finance, tech, and, of course, power. So I love Succession. Each week, we'll be talking about what happens on the show and talking to some of the people who make it. But mostly, I'll be unpacking how the real world is reflected in the world on screen. This is like OJ. I I mean, except if OJ never killed anyone. Who said I never killed anyone? Okay, so this week on Succession, Logan's inner circle is in full crisis mode. Kendall's public rebellion has left his father and the company in a spiral. The cruise ship scandal looms large. I want everyone lawyered up. Longtime general counsel Jerry Kelman calls the White House press secretary. She wants to get a temperature read on any potential investigation. The president is basically supportive, but they think it might be best for there not to be a call with you on the White House log today. Later this episode, I've got Jennifer Palmieri as my guest. She was communications director for the Obama White House as well as Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. We'll talk about how Jerry's phone call compares with the real life back and forth between corporations and the White House. That was a dumb call because that is like just putting everyone at risk. But first, power rankings. So, who's up and who's down in the long game for control of Waystar? It's me. Are you kidding? I'm not kidding. It's actually you? It's me, Shiv Blewett with Lisa. Let's not overthink this. Jerry is the new CEO of Waystar. She's up, for now. But it's an interim appointment and Logan has no intention of loosening his grip. And who's down? Probably Shiv. Shiv makes a play that falls completely flat. She tries to snag the lawyer that Logan is after, Lisa Arthur. Problem is, Arthur's already consulting with Kendall. End of conversation. You know, you'd actually consider working with that disingenuous fuck doll He's not on the level, Lise. Shiv, I am unavailable to help you. So who made the biggest power move this episode? Was it Greg's lame attempt at a social media strategy? You're the number one trending topic ahead of Tater Tots, and the Pope followed you. Uh, Wow. Okay, no, this is not the... Is this the real... uh, No, I don't think this is a Pope. Oh, Greg. Probably not. So could it be Roman? He lost the CEO gig to Jerry, sure, but he kind of sort of endorsed her in an awkward call with Dad. Now he's in a perfect position to be groomed. I think it should be me, but if you don't think I'm ready, maybe a couple of years under the wing of an older uh, hen could, you know, see me crack out of the old egg. One thing is clear. Logan is in Sarajevo with three guys he neither respects nor trusts, but he's still in charge, sort of. We'll fucking beast them. We'll go full fucking beast! And now I want to go back to that key scene from this episode. Jerry is making a call to the president's press secretary. She's asking, but not asking, for the Department of Justice to look the other way on the whole scandal. It's deliciously awkward. And Logan is hearing everything on the speakerphone. Let's listen. Michelle, Jerry Kelman, how are you doing? Listen, I just wanted to say it was all nonsense, and we know the president will be supportive, but we just wanted to answer, to, to offer to answer any questions he may have. Hi, yeah. Jerry, I think he just feels for Logan at this difficult time. Great. Well, just let him know that we are not asking for favors. We hear you. We just wouldn't, simply in terms of resources, want DOJ to follow Kendall off down this rabbit hole of bitterness. Okay. Well, you know how much the president respects Logan, okay? Great. So, off the record, um, what's the temperature at Maine Justice? Any danger of them or Southern District going Batman on this? Um, The Attorney General is very smart. Oh, we all love Bavik. He'll he'll see through this, right? It's just the DA likes to think she's something of a straight shooter. Marilyn's prickly, so that's your only issue, Marilyn. Well, maybe you should just fire her. 
ha ha ha. Justice can't do nothing. Well, they could. It's out of our hands. Not if you grab it. Um, but look, we don't want to fall out with him. Well, no. He's the president. <laughs> no, sure. Real-life media conglomerates lobby Washington, D.C. all the time. And the person at the other end of some of these kinds of phone calls was Jennifer Palmieri. She's currently co-host of The Circus, Inside the Greatest Political Show on Earth, a documentary series on Showtime. By the way, Jennifer and I talked when I had a cold. Remember those? Hi, Jennifer. Welcome. Kara, I mean, it's great to be with you. Like, this big deal. This is like the coolest thing. Like... It may be the coolest of all your podcasts. I don't know. Thank you. I, I am cool. All you are. You are. Time. You are. You are setting the standard. So listening to that call we just oh heard, well, first off, did you ever get calls like that? I have anxiety after hearing that phone call. Yeah. Because it's just like, because anything involving justice is just so sensitive and I'm like processing my mind if, you know, how many crimes were committed in the course of that phone call. Right. And just <laughs> like feeling anxiety for the press secretary about how you yeah, how, how you handle something when it's like a person that's important to you. But like you just can't get the White House just can't be like just can't be anywhere near a anything involving justice. And anytime anything involving justice would come up, people like me, the press people, you're just like backing it up. You're like, get me out of the room talk to the council's office, like, not it, do not include me, do not, do not talk to me. You're like imagining legal bills racking up in your brain. And most people are sophisticated enough to know, particularly when it's a justice department thing, like that is just a thing, you know, that's just the like third rail that the White House has to stay away from. But there are, you know, as you know, Kara, rich doesn't equal smart. Right. Right. Powerful right. doesn't no. equal savvy. No. no. So there are people that will make phone calls like that, even though it's in the end reckless and more likely to backfire on you, more likely that the White House is their inclination will be like to come down harder on a friend. Did you get calls like that? The sort of weird back channel awkwardness? You get weird back channel awkwardness calls all the time. The funny thing is, like, they think that you have more power than you do, too, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. like if the, the president of the United States has, like, like, you have zero control. And, like, the White House actually has zero, like, actually very, like, maybe power, but not control. Right, right. So could you give me an example without naming names? I think what probably what, what may be what is more present in my mind is the th examples of things we don't do. You know, like when I left the Obama White House and I went and worked for um, the Clinton campaign, um, people thought like, oh, you're probably talking to your Obama colleagues all the time. I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> because yeah. that yeah. would be dumb because they are the government. We are a presidential campaign and they can't, you know, they're, they're not involved in politics. And so you might think, you know, I think you might think that, um, these, some of these people are my closest friends and been called my colleagues for a really long time. I might be calling them to get their advice and whatnot. And you actually don't do that because, you know, people who are in the White House are smart enough generally. I mean, there's been some big exceptions in the last four years. But if you're like, yeah, <laughs> you're smart enough to know what to stay away from. And, you know, reporters will say like, oh, well, you must be talking to so-and-so. Or you, And you're like, no, you know, I'm like, well, why not? Because I'm not stupid. You know, I know where the lines are. Well, most people do, right? You know the lines. Are. One of the things you just said is you're counting your legal bills. Yeah. Because a lot of people, you've gotten dragged in, right? Everybody, oh, yeah. What happens? Can you explain that, how you get dragged in? If you get on a call like this and then people find out and it gets leaked to a reporter, et cetera, et cetera. What happens is, I mean, I, you know, in my own, like, career, I, um, Monica Lewinsky was my intern. So, you know, at a young age, I got, you know, I had to go, you know, FBI knocking on your door, o'clock <laughs> on a Friday night, because, um, you know, because she worked for me. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden you are thrown into the middle of the, you know, this massive grand jury that results in the, you know, impeachment of the president of the United States. Um, right. And just anything, you know, even it was like during those times, during particularly those first few weeks after that story broke in 98, 
No one, I was a scheduler at that point. I, at first I had worked for Leon Panetta, who was the chief of staff. I was a scheduler at that point for President Clinton. And um, no one wanted to be around President Clinton because as soon as somebody heard, you know, the grand jury or Ken Starr, the investigators heard that you had been in a meeting with Bill Clinton, you got a subpoena. Right. And like a lot of phone calls go unreturned or texts go unanswered because you look at it and you're like, that person is asking me something that's potentially a problem and I am not going to respond. If you do respond, even if you are the assistant to someone who got the phone call, you can get hauled into the investigation. And then all of a sudden, you know, once everybody starts, we're all friends and colleagues and everybody's looking out for each other until lawyers get involved and then people freak out. You hire your own lawyer. The If you sign up for this kind of insurance, this weird insurance that you can get through the Department of Justice, your legal bills will be paid for to some degree. Really? There's an insurance program, an internal insurance program. Yeah. If you get dragged into a scandal. I did it during Obama. I didn't know about it in Clinton or maybe it didn't exist during Clinton, but you like... Um, and then it's like, if you're doing in the course of doing your job, something, you know, you get called as a witness or whatever, it doesn't protect you if you are guilty of a crime, but it protects you if you're like collateral damage, right? Which and a lot of us end up being. Because now there's these congressional investigators, there's special prosecutors, there's all kinds of people with subpoena power, in other words. Yeah, yeah. And then... You know, so it's like you're protecting yourself on the front end to never get into that kind of situation because, you know, if you just happen to be in a room where this conversation goes on, even if you don't put, take part in it or somebody reaches out to you, that alone can get you into the middle of a, you know, really tough legal situation. And even if, you know, beyond like legal fees and stuff like that, it's like, once you're in the middle of it, you got the ick on you, right? You have yeah, the stink, stink of right. it on you, even if you had nothing to do with it, right? So right, exactly, it is. exactly. So let's talk about the language used. You said you made you feel, it made you, you know, you get nervous. Uh, they're not asking for a favor, yet they clearly are. The woman on the other end says the president feels for Logan at this difficult time. Are there catchphrases? Were they being careful enough in this back and forth? No, no, honestly, no. The press, even the press secretary, as you know, I think she thought that she was being, you know, and what's also interesting to me is the, her intonation, the tone of her voice, right? Where she is like, matter of fact, like the president drives, or matter of fact, president feels for Logan at this difficult time. Um, and, you know, she's signaling to um, Jerry, like, yeah. Shut up. Stop this conversation. Um, and then Jerry is careful at first, but Jerry gets more and more desperate. And then she gets into like, she gets into a very, that is a very, like, Jerry brings the entire conversation and therefore the press secretary too, into a very dangerous zone. And, you know, the press secretary says, we, you know, main justice, we cannot get involved, but she's suggesting that maybe she would if she could, right? So like, lots of problems there. Lots of problems. So in, including saying you could fire her, right? Because that could be taken out of context in a transcript. Certainly example. that is a massive screaming story. That is a massive, massive, massive problem. So so does, does it get recorded when you talk to no. people like that? or not? But today people do recordings, right? Because everybody has phones. People do recordings. It is, I think, you know, at least in the Democratic White Houses that I worked in, and I, I don't I don't mean to suggest that Biden's different. I think they're probably the same. I just mean the I didn't work in the last one. I didn't work in Trump. Um, the you know after Nixon, you know LBJ recorded everything. Nixon recorded everything. After that, everybody stopped recording anything, and it's like sort of sad because you lose. Those are great oral histories, right? Right, they're great records, but it's just way too risky. And so there's like you know. Nothing that gets recorded. Sometimes the president's voice might get recorded in speech prep or um, in like a debate prep or something so like that. Mic. Yeah, mock. Mic. Yeah. Um, and even that, people get really antsy about you know anything that is recording the president's voice. Um, and and you're and and like you would never record yourself on the phone or anybody else on the phone. Plus in DC, I think it's actually legal and illegal. I think you have to have two way agreement. But, but emails, there's emails and texts do get pulled in, right? Whatever you say, like even if you say an off. Doesn't thing. matter. Yeah. Email, text, all of those things, you know, they're saved somewhere. The, if you are emailing, texting on a 
call with uh, your White House phone, still not recorded. So well, I should say, still not recorded legally, but legally, right, yeah. another country is probably listening in. Honestly, that is likely. It is likely, even when you have an encrypted White House phone, that there are any number of foreign entities that are actually listening on this call. I have always been warned that that was a possible, that you should assume that, you should assume that. Assume the Russians are listening. Assume the Russians, like, Chinese, Iran, whoever, right. Yeah, yeah. So when you think about uh, people making those calls, you said people are rich but stupid, like as we know. <laughs> they still do it. They still try this to do it. This is why I think, you know, some people can be wealthy but not very smart is, they're smart in their in their own field, and they and they think that you know they they kind of look down on government. They don't think highly of government, and so they think that they're smarter than the people in the White House, and therefore the people in the White House are just being ninnies or wimps or and yeah. like you gotta like do it the way we do it, and that's why you might get otherwise smart people doing dumb things because they think they know better, which often gets people in trouble. So in speak, speaking back to the show, um, this shows still corporations have big power when they call the president or they try to reach the president. One of the things she's saying, can they get them on the blower together? Like meaning, can we get the president to talk to Logan Roy? Do we want to get the old guys on the blower so they can just chat for five? This will all be great, Jerry. Just find me whenever on anything, okay? Great. Well, I appreciate getting a read. Um, many thanks. A president would never talk to... Uh, a very, even a very powerful supporter when they're in the midst of a crisis. Correct. Correct. Like, correct. I mean, in my experience, what is more likely to happen, the bigger the corporation, the more they have at stake, the more the White House is going to run away. They are not going to let the President of the United States get on, you know, Joe Biden's not going to get on the phone with like his moral equivalent of this, right? That is like never going to happen. And so the, you know, again, traditionally, and I think that's not just true of, Democratic White Houses. I think prior to Trump, that was, you know, tr probably true with the Bush, you know, George W. Bush White House and the H.W. Bush White House. Like they're going to like these people who are there are seasoned and they're like not going to allow that to happen. And they would much rather take the political hit of your big friend being pissed off at you than subject yourself to, you know, what could explode into, um, you know, a presidency ending crisis. Any right. one of these, like a really dumb thing, can spiral out of control and bring down a presidency. There's landmines. Every now, one of the landmines is, of course, the press. When this stuff gets out in the press, and little bits and pieces get out, yeah. right? First, later, later, it's all brought together most of the time. The Washington Post once wrote that you had a reputation for fostering and maintaining good relations with the national media, <laughs> while at the Obama White House. How do you think you got that rep, besides being just charming? Well? <laughs> um, I love the press. I like humans. I like, um, I find them interesting. I think, I, I do believe that, um, you know, uh, na nations act in their self-interest and so do, and so do reporters. So you're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna not write the bad story if you're nice to them, but it like right. helps, um, if you ha are able to build a relationship of trust, right? So that, and that's just the most important thing. And part of trust is just like being a nice human so that they feel respected by you and they feel like uh, they can talk to you and that they can confide in you. Um, and that, um, and then that you're building trust so that when they come to you and say, I'm working on this story, um, here are the eight things I'm reporting. And then you enter into like this weird conversation where it's like, do you want to comment on them? I don't want to comment on those eight bad things because I know that once I, once I, what they really want is a White House spokesperson in the story, right? So even though it might yeah. be helpful if I, you know, was able to make some comments about, if I could like shade some of what they're saying or steer them in a different direction, it's very dangerous to put new facts on the record and to actually, you know, do that, to respond. And so instead you're in this weird off the record world where you say, like, I'm not going to comment on the seven things because you're just like, because basically you're confirming them. You're basically letting that go. But like this eighth thing, let me just tell you off the record, like that's wrong. And a good reporter will be like, I trust her. She, if she's trying to steer me from making a mistake, 
So let me go back and do some more and do some more reporting. And so, you know, that trust, when you need that credibility, it like really matters. What about their bosses and the owners of the media outlets? I mean, I'm sure you've been in conversations with lots of those yeah. over time. What? What is that relationship like? Because that's a different relationship. They, there's the re- relationship you have with the reporter, then there's the relationship you have with the editor, and then there's a relation, and then there's the owners. And there really still is for most publications. I think that, like, I don't honestly, I don't, I don't deal a lot with Fox News, so I can't really speak to them. But I think even there, there's they still try to maintain some kind of wall between the reporting side and the business side. Now there are times where like the question is raised, shouldn't we call Arthur Sulzberger? Like shouldn't we call the owner of whatever the newspaper Arthur is? Arthur Sulzberger is the owner of the New York Times, but go ahead. The Sulzberger family. Right. And um that never works. <laughs> I mean, I think back in the day, I think like back in the JFK days, you know, I think that worked. I think that like the owners of the news outlets saw themselves as, you know, it's, it was like a civic thing. It wasn't necessarily just a business thing. And they were like all more chummy with the White House and th- that kind of thing might work. But it would ne- it just it never works now. What if you need what if you need them to downplay coverage? They won't do that. No, either, no, right? no, no, no. They will not. No, they will not. It is, I just think it's such a bad move to ever try to reach out to the owners because all you're going to do is piss off the reporter, piss off the editors. It won't work. And you've marked yourself as kind of a bad sport and a little naive and a little and (laughs) corrupty, right? Yeah, corrupt. I mean, corruptish. 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 Although, although a a lot, I mean, I got to, I got to tell you, like, a lot of the coverage I see is not right. Like, you know, when I see a story that's really reported well and they got the, they got what's actually happening and they presented it as such is one out of 10. One out of 10? Yeah. I mean, you know, now like what I consider to be fair and presented correctly, right? No, I have a point of view. I'm like subjective because I'm working at the White House and all of that. Right. And, you know, then the, then there's then there are the stories that are true, like everything that's in there are factual, but they're coming to the wrong conclusion. They're coming to the wrong place. That may be because they want to come to the wrong place. That may be because they don't have enough facts. And you, and I didn't share those facts for reason for, re, you know, for a good reason. But it means like the story didn't come out as well as it could have or didn't reflect the truth as well as it could have. And actually, a lot of uh, like people like you who I deal with in tech have been vehemently like, you're, you didn't get it right. You're always wrong, this and that. And then years later, they would, after they left, they would go, oh, that was right. And I, and I just was trying to speak. Yeah, but I think you're a particularly good journalist. There, I know. There was, a, there was a venture capitalist. If we would publish at midnight, right, or something like that, he would call me at 11.55 and go, are you sure you're right? Are you sure? Just to throw. F- just to fuck with. <laughs> doubt in yeah. Mind. Just to fuck with me. And I'd be like, oh, God, I have to check again. But I was right, you know what I mean. But it's it's an interesting. But thing. I think, but you're, but you, but you're like you are a very modern journal, journalist with old fashioned sensibilities about really understanding the business you're covering and the people that you cover, and like so. I yeah, think I would never you get call it politics. I would never cover politics in a million years. But although I am now with tech, it's the like, same. So it's, I don't know that it's no. But now I'm always right about politics because tech is in the middle of it. Sure right is. Now. Sure is. Yeah. Let me ask you another question. Way back in 2008, there was a dinner between Rupert Murdoch and President Obama, recounted by writer Michael Wolf. The architect of Fox News, Roger Ailes, was there too. He did not get along with Obama, obviously, as you know. Uh, But Murdoch and the president-to-be kind of called a truce. You weren't there. um, But were there other dinners or phone calls like that? Uh, It felt like a succession-style moment. Same thing with with the Mark Zuckerberg Trump meetings. That have been reported recently. Yeah. Um, does that, do those happen a lot, these dinners? Um, not a lot, but, and I wouldn't like disclose details about that, but I think they're a good idea. I, I think it's a good idea for the President of the United States and I, you know, to be face to face with a person that um, has a big impact on media in the US, right? Like, why not? Why not get those two together and just have a better sense of each other and hope that that, you know, it's not like 
it's a tit for tat or it's going to, but like, it might just make things better. Oh, that was what was alleged with Mark Zuckerberg and Trump dinner, right? With Jared Kushner. It was a tit. That, that's what was been alleged. So, but, but doesn't now any dinner look like that? Like they're trying to influence battle essentially. Um, it does look like that. So like you may feel unbalanced. It's not worth it depending on who the person is, but I do find like a small example is there's a tradition that the president gets together with network anchors on the on the State of the Union Day and has an off the record lunch with them. No one's trying to write a story or drive a headline, but you're able to just kind of like hear from the president and get a better sense of them. And the president kind of understand where other people are coming from. Like that is helpful. We may live in a country, like an environment now where it's too risky. The optics of that, depending on who the person the president's going to meet with are too risky. It's a very high bar. I would say like if I was advising Biden, I'd be like, that's a really high bar. Like don't meet with anybody, but like regular people, mm -hmm. right? Don't meet with powerful people. Right. <laughs> don't meet with any powerful people like whatsoever. Don't meet with any billionaires. Don't meet. Don't, well, don't meet with any, you know, like it just got to, if you're going to meet with somebody that owns a news outlet, like you got to be really careful about who that person is and like what the expectations right. are, what it looks like. Or someone that you look too friendly yep. to. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. The same thing. So you shifted from the White House to the campaign trail ahead of the 2016 election. Yeah. You just said how it changed the relationship you had. Um, with, with with the White House, did it change how you had relationships with with media and the Titans who run them? Yes, because all of a sudden you were well, two in two ways. I mean, one was that I, I was working for a woman, and that was just you know wasn't I, I didn't appreciate how different that was. It seemed I sound stupid, but I didn't appreciate how different that was going to be. But then the other thing is you have to understand you are content now. Um, you are going to make them a lot of money if you have a interesting presidential campaign. Um, and so the stakes are just a little different than they are in the white house where people are still concerned about clicks and eyeballs, but it's not as, um, ferocious as it is on a campaign because a lot of outlets make their money that year, right? That's their big, that's yeah. big. So your content, that's an interesting way to put it. Your content, your content, your, so the, and they have a limited amount of time to make a presidential campaign really interesting. And they got to like live off that land and make, get as much attention as they can in those months. And so, you know, they're just going to drive, they, they have a, unsatiable need to drive controversy. And, um, you know, the really, one of the really hard things specifically was that it, it, meant, it meant our coverage early on ended up being a lot of Hillary versus Hillary, right? Just a lot of focus right, on her right. and her, um, and not like Clinton versus Sanders. Let's cover a race, but it's, and, and that is, that means even fair-minded journalists that you normally have a good relationship with are all of a sudden being pressured and driven to just create problematic coverage for you as a business model. So, did, did, so you so you said previous relations don't, don't help your efforts to influence the coverage, correct? They help. They are better than not having these relationships. But like you're, you know, you know, sometimes like I had some, you know, my colleagues in the Obama White House be like, press aren't your friends. They're not your friends. Remember, they're not your friends. I was like, I don't like I don't need any more coaching. <laughs> but like they are my friends. These people are my friends, but they are not going to pursue something that they believe in or they're not going to they're not going to like walk away from something their boss is pressuring them to do because I, you know, advocate to them that they should not do that. Like. They're not. Um, so again, it is still worthwhile to have a good relationship with them, to have them trust you. I gain a lot just from understanding them and they gain a lot. I think it's really important that like White House's campaigns let people open up and let the press, those that you trust, understand you and get a good sense of what's happening in your White House. And then when shit goes wrong, when they are talking to their editors and they're representing, hey, no, but you got you guys are getting it wrong. Like it's not like that. It's like this. The editor still may push the reporter in the direction that I don't want them to go to, but at least our case was heard, right? At least the editor has heard what is actually going on, and then they're going to do what they're going to do. But like that's that means something. 
Yeah. So when you say at least their case was heard, do you think that was an effective call by Jerry in succession? No, that was a dumb call. That was a dumb call because that just, you know, anything involving justice, a criminal, you know, possible criminal investigation, any of that is like um, just putting everyone at, it's just, it's just been everybody at risk. Yeah. So what would the press secretary do then if you had gotten that call? I would, yeah, I would call the council, the White House council. And I would say, I got this phone call. This is what the person said to me. This is how I responded. Um, and I just want to like note it for the record um, and see if there's anything else I need to do. Right. But you'd be worried having that. You'd be like, oh, shit, I just said that. So if you could suggest a succession writer's room for a story beat or character, because it's obviously moving into investigations, what would you think would be interesting? What would be what is a good storyline is how all of the alliances, the people that are so chummy in the White House, how it all turns once there are lawyers involved and people get scared about their own um, exposure and their own vulnerabilities. And you're like super loyal to the president. And you're super loyal to each other. But then all of a sudden, I mean, there is nothing more sobering than the FBI knocking on your door at 11 o'clock on a Friday night. <laughs> Which you had happen. Which I have had Which happen. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hi. Hi, boys. How you doing? All right, Jennifer. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Jennifer Palmieri. She's the former communications director for the Obama White House and Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Her most recent book is called Dear Madam President, an open letter to the women who will run the world. And she also appears on The Circus, Inside the Greatest Show on Earth. You can listen to the next episode of this podcast right after episode two of Succession, which drops Sunday, October 24th on HBO Max. This is an official companion podcast for the HBO series Succession. It's a production of HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. Kara Swisher hosts the show. Our executive producers are Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna Weiss-Berman. Our senior producer of the show is Nick White, Shaka Tafari and Michael Catano are our producers. Darby Maloney is our editor, and our engineer is Hannes Brown. Production music is courtesy of HBO. It's war! Fuck off! It's war. Fuck off. Good? Good. <laughs>